Welcome. In this session, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be talking about the traditions of men versus the real you know, will of God, the real word of God. We're going to be talking about how Jesus called a woman a, a dog. Yeah, he did. Um, that's what it says. And we're also going to be talking about how Jesus miraculously fed 4,000. So let's get right into this. Um, verse 1. The Pharisees and scribes came to, to Yeshua, came to Jesus from Jerusalem, saying, why do, your, why do your disciples disobey the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, let's stop there for a second. We want to make sure we understand everything here as much as possible. So the Pharisees and the scribes, two of the leading groups of people when it comes to religious matters in those days, came to Jesus, came to Yeshua, and asked him, why, why do your disciples disobey the tradition of the elders? See, even today, a lot of people in the Jewish world, and actually even in the Christian world as well, they really high, hold high the tradition of the elders, you know? And like, for example, in the Christian, uh, in Christian circles, we got the tradition of the elders. It depends what circle, obviously, that you're, you're in. But let's say you're involved in the um, modern evangelical, you know, um, conservative Christian circles. So the tradition of the elders would be that you, you that you come forward to the altar and give your life to Jesus or, and, and this kind of stuff. Tradition that you'd have to do this. Like if you don't do this, then something you're missing something in your life or, you know, or in charismatic circles or Pentecostal circles. There's a tradition of if you don't fit in particularly in this way, um, then you are just, you're not really missing it. And so what they do is they don't go by the actual scriptures, really. They don't, they don't look at the full scope of scripture. They take maybe one little passage or maybe even no passages and build a theology on their tradition because they heard it from their mentors, their teachers, their, you know, pastors, and that those people heard it from their leaders and those people heard it. And it's just, handed on down through the line and somebody somewhere has got to say, who, oh, wait a second. Is this really, is this really what God wants? Is this really, is this practice, is this doctrine really in the scriptures? Is it really what God said? We're not talking about what Job said or what Paul said. Is it really what God said? Okay. And it's so, it's so easy for people to associate their spiritual leader with something that's from God. Let, let's not do that unless it says in the scriptures, you know, thus saith the Lord. Okay. I don't know. There's a lot of different factors that can come into place and you got to just take a little bit of common sense with things. And yeah, that's, I mean, it, it can get kind of complicated, but let's make it simple here. The Pharisees um, observed a tradition that was handed down by their, their elders for I don't know how many generations or how many decades or centuries. The tradition was that they wash their hands before they eat bread. I know most people today would say, well, that's a very, I mean, even, even you know, most people today would say that's a good thing to do. But they asked Jesus, why is it that your disciples don't really religiously obey this? Jesus answered, him, answered them in verse 3. Why do you also disobey the commandment of God because of your tradition? So, again, you see how Jesus just snapped back at them more or less. I mean, he didn't. He could have said, "Well, you know, I'm sorry that uh, you know that you, that you you think that I'm disobeying the traditions of the respected people that God set in place, the elders, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of this country, or the spiritual leaders of this religion." Yada yada yada. He made no apologies whatsoever. He he just turned right back at them without missing a beat, saying, "Why do you also disobey the commandment of God 
Okay, so he he just made a very stark contrast there between what they said. Why do you disobey the tradition of the elders? And he said, "Well, wait a second. Let, let's get into perspective here. Let's really let, let's reassess. Why do you disobey the commandment of God because of your tradition?" Verse four, Jesus said the words in red, the words of the Lord. He said, "For God commanded, honor your father." and your mother. Okay, so he's quoting out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Again, Yeshua's quoting Torah. Okay, um, continuing, Jesus continued by saying, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. Okay, Oh, this is the grace Jesus. This is the Jesus of love. This is the Jesus of grace. He just, he said, this is what the commandment of God is. He he held people to this. He said the commands of God was honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil against your father or your mother, let him be put to death according to God. Exodus 21, verse 17, Leviticus 20, verse 9. Wow. But he says, he continues saying, but you say, okay, so this is what God says. Honor your father and your mother and don't speak evil against your father or your mother. Let him, or, or, you know, those people who do are worthy of death. But you say, But you, but you say, whoever may tell his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have gotten from me is a gift devoted to God. In other words, I could have helped you, but now I, I'm doing this. I'm devoting this gift to God. So yeah, you needed some food. Yeah. You needed, you needed me to slaughter the, you know, the, the cow or the, or the fattened uh, lamb. Sorry. Sorry, dad. Sorry, mom. I just I, I think I'll take this and I'll, uh, I'll I'll give it at the altar for God instead of, of helping you. Uh, verse six. Jesus continues. The Lord Himself continues. He shall not honor his father or mother. You have made the commandment of God void. In other words, not of of not, no effect, as if it's not in effect anymore, as if it's not in uh, in force anymore. You've made the commandment of God void because of your tradition. So apparently there was a tradition back in those days where, no, you, if you got a gift, you give it to God and you leave your mother and your father, you know, as off to the side here, okay? Uh, instead of honoring them, uh, you give that gift to God. And, and even today, like, again, you know, I know Christian people that they do the same kind of thing. Well, you know, uh, I know it's secular, but I'm doing it for God. Oh, I know it's uh, I know it's not good, but I'm doing it for God. You know, you can even I mean, you can take that in whatever area that that applies to. Okay, um, but let me give you one uh, particular example. There's some people that say that they smoke dope you know, for God or whatever. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, I mean, and there's lots of other applications to this principle, okay? You you do something that's not right, but you say you're doing it for God and you justify it and you make it, you know. But apparently this was a tradition back then. So Jesus just nailed them and said, listen, you you are making void the commandment of God. You are transgressing the ways of God. You are transgressing the Torah for the sake of your tradition. Now, once again, the Pharisees were the ones who were the sinners, okay? Not the ex-prostitute that came in repentance who gave up her old lifestyle and came in repentance at Jesus' feet listening to every word that he said. That's not the sinner. She was a sinner, but she, you know, she wasn't. I mean, she she became a saint, because she came to the feet of Jesus in repentance and she gave up her old life of sin. But the Pharisees accused him of being a friend of sinners. Hmm. The sinners were really them. Those were the real sinners. Was Jesus a friend of the Pharisees? You judge. Okay, verse 7. 
You hypocrites. Again, he loves to use that word hypocrites, okay? Uh, meaning you pretend to be better than you are. You pretend to be um, good when you are evil. You pretend to be righteous when you are a, a sinner, a really a bad sinner. Well did Yeshayahu, Isaiah, prophesy of you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips. Oh, they say all the right things. Yada, yada, yada. Yaki, yaki, yaki. Yappy, yappy, yappy. They say all the right things. But their heart is far from me. They would rather live for... They, they have selfish ambitions. They have secular, worldly ambitions. Verse 9, and in vain do they worship me. You worship me? A lot of people go, oh, that's great. You worship God. Yeah, all right, on. You, you worship God? In vain. It's possible to worship God in vain. If your heart is not really, really dedicated wholly and solely unto him. I'm talking about dedicated. I'm talking about if it costs you your friends, so be it. If it costs you your some family members, so be it. If it costs you everything. Okay? That's dedicated to God. And in vain do they worship me. Teaching as doctrine rules ba made by men. <laughs> oh, again, I mean, I can talk a lot about this, but I'm not going to I'm not going to really dwell on it very much here, but uh we see this so much in uh, Christian circles today. Um, even in uh, Jewish circles today, a lot of religions, they have rules made by men, but they paint it over as if it's rules of God. They got rules made by men, but they present it as the word of God. So you got to ask questions. You got to ask honest questions. Dishonest questions, questions just to cause trouble or just questions just to be ornery or with an attitude, a wrong attitude, I condemn that. But asking honest questions is a good thing. It's a good thing. Everything you do, everything, you, I mean, you walk in, for example, you walk in church and you see Bibles in, in, in the back of pews. And everything you see, you should ask a question. Is this really the way it should be? Well, let's look back to the let's look back to the model church, the book of Acts. They didn't have even they didn't even have Bibles. What did they have? They had separate scrolls of each book of what we call the Bible, plus many more. Um and many of which you we can find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, that is a historical fact. What it I mean, I think it's really great to have a I mean, I, I, I got Bibles, but I think it's really great to have them separately because uh, it, show, it, it, it preserves the individuality of each author and each culture and each context of each book, okay? And I think that's very important, not to just slap them all together and canonize. Where, where do you get this? I mean, certainly nothing commanded of God that we see in the scriptures. To him who has ears, let him hear. Because <laughs> I know a lot of you probably have a problem with what I'm saying here. But I hope that you don't. And I hope that God gives you ears to hear and eyes to see what I'm saying. It's good to ask honest questions. It's good to, to refer back to the ancient scriptures for a guide, as a guide, uh, and and to ask honest questions about everything, every single thing, everything, everything about your service, everything about you, everything about your prayer, everything about your devotions, everything about your doctrine. Ask honest questions. And you know what? Really, in the end, you'll have stronger faith. I guarantee you. You're not asking questions for the sake of doubt. No. You're asking questions for the sake of truth. You want to know the truth. 
these Pharisees should have asked honest questions. They should have said, is this really, I mean, this is a tradition that's been handed down for X number of years or decades or centuries. But, but really, is this really mandatory? Is this really what we should be doing? Do we, is it in the, thus saith the Lord portions of scripture? Is it? If it's not, then let's not be too gung-ho about it, okay? Verse 10, he summoned the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand. That which enters into the mouth doesn't defile the man, but that which proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. So what Jesus is doing here is he is, obviously, he is, again, bringing things into perspective. Does that mean that you can just put anything into your mouth and it's okay, it's not going to hurt you? Of course not. I, I mean, you ask, you ask anybody that has any kind of sense at all, common sense at all, and if you I mean, ask any doctor, they would tell you there's lots of things you can put in your mouth that, that'll just completely destroy your body. However... What Jesus is talking about here is in a deep spiritual level, you got to be more concerned about what's coming out of your mouth. Put in into perspective. Be careful what you say. Even when you're alone, if you talk to yourself, whatever, because we have the great cloud of witnesses. We have the angels are watching, the spirits of just men made perfect. We come, I mean, we have, uh, there are a lot of things unseen that you don't know about. A lot of people don't know about. Um, everything that we say, everything we do is written down in the book. It's recorded. Uh, whether we know it or not, whether we are alone or in public. So be careful what you say, even in private. Verse 12. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Jesus, Jesus, wait a second. Do you, I mean, we know you're, you're, you're a nice guy or we know that you're a, a good guy here. And, you, you know, I mean, these people were offended. Did you, do you know they were offended at what you said? Verse 13, Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly father did not plant will be uprooted. What's he talking about here? Leave them alone, he says. They are blind guides of the blind. They are blind guides of the blind. If the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. <laughs> what an answer. What an answer. Again, think about what Jesus could have said. He had any every opportunity to say, oh, did I offend them? Oh, did I make, oh, I'm sorry. Just tell them I, I'm sorry. You know, I, I apologize for that. I didn't mean to offend them. He even rubbed it in even further. He says, just let them alone. They're a plant that, that they are plants that the Father has not planted. They will be uprooted. They're blind and they lead the blind. Make sure when you listen to that favorite preacher, pastor, or anybody, for that matter, make sure that you're not blind and make sure that you're not being led by someone who's blind. But those who are blind don't really know, do they? If the blind guides the blind, both will fall into a pit, Jesus said. And he just said, leave them alone. They want, if they're offended, they're mad, they're angry, they're fuming, leave, just let them go. They're going to be uprooted. They're weeds. Verse 15, Peter answered him, explain the parable to us. So Yeshua said, do you also still not understand? Like, do you also still not understand? You know, like you're supposed to know this stuff. Verse 17, don't you understand that whatever goes into, a, into the mouth passes into the belly and then out of the body? But the things which proceed out of the mouth come out of the heart and they defile a man. For, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual sins, thefts, false testimony, false witnessing, that would be, and blasphemies, speaking evil against somebody 
or God forbid, you know, God himself. Verse 20, these are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile the man. Okay, so again, Jesus is just drawing a contrast here. He is saying, generally speaking, you should be a lot more concerned about what's coming out of your mouth than what's going in your mouth. Verse 21, Jesus went out from there and withdrew into the region excuse me, of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a Canaanite woman. This is not a Jew. This is a Canaanite woman. You got to understand in those days, Jew, it was commonly recognized that salvation um, the word of God, the scriptures, everything to do, the blessings of God were for the Jews, you know. But behold, a Canaanite woman came out from those borders, from Tyre and Sidon, and cried and said, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Again, the, the, the phrase son of David uh, is a direct reference. It's directly, you basically you are referring to Jesus as the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Christ. Because that is one of the titles of the Messiah, the Messiah, that is, the Son of David. As I've said in a previous video, even Jews today uh, in the Jewish circles would tell you that uh, the term Son of David is, is, uh, is a reference to the Messiah. And also, believe it or not, the term Son of Joseph is also uh, a reference to the Messiah. <coughs> Excuse me. So this Canaanite woman came and said, Have mercy upon me, Lord, you son of David. You're the Messiah, she was saying. That's basically what she was saying. Messiah, Mashiach, the one who is to come, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. Have pity on me, have pity on me. Cast some love this way. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. No. Did Jesus say, oh, I'm sorry to hear of all of your affliction. I'm sorry to hear about what's happening to you. And I'm, I'm sorry that you are such an outcast and how these people are, 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 are not, you know, they basically just exclude you because you're not a Jew and they're racist. Did Jesus say that? Let's read on. This is the Jesus of the Bible, by the way. This is not the Jesus of modern-day Christianity or church, modern-day church, generally speaking. This is the real Jesus of Christianity. You want the real Jesus, not a golden calf Jesus. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word. Wait, what? A, Jesus didn't even pay attention to her, like didn't even answer her. This is a poor woman. An outcast, someone who was of a race that it was, that was looked upon, looked down upon. This was someone who had a daughter severely possessed by a demon, and Jesus ignored her. Huh? Let's read on. His disciples came and begged him, <laughs> begged him, saying, "Send her away, for she cries after us." Oh. <laughs> Now we got insult. We got, we got, uh, you know, we call it, um, you add, uh, what's that phrase now I'm looking for? Insult to injury, okay? Uh, the disciples add, add, add uh, insult to injury here. And uh, basically just say, send her away. Get, get her, get her out of here. It's a woman, you know, she's of a race that's considered to be, uh, un, you know, lower race or, well, you know, that's, and she's got a daughter that's severely possessed and we know that you have the power to do it, but just send her away, you know. And they saw that Jesus was ignoring her. We're talking about the lovely Jesus here. We're talking about Jesus loves me, this I know for the, what, tells me so? Does it really? Okay, so, and Je but Jesus answered and, and said this, I wasn't sent to anyone but the lost but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This woman traveled out of her country, traveled to come and see Jesus, coming begging him, 
calling him Lord, accepting him as Messiah, and, and, and calling him to come and, and have mercy and, and shed some love her, her way. He ignored her, number one. Number two, his disciples said, just get it rid of her, and get, get, out, get her out of here. Number three, to add insult to, upon insult to injury, he said, I wasn't sent to anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, just the Jewish people. That's all I'm, ta- that's all I'm here for. Wow, well, really? Verse 25. But she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She was persistent and she was humble. Persistent and humble. These are the keys, okay? She was not offended. Jesus was for Jesus didn't didn't say, Blessed are you who are not offended because of me for no reason. He knew that the way he was and what he says and what he does and what he represents and who he is is offensive. No wonder he said, You'll be blessed if you're not offended of me. But she wasn't offended. She did not have pride, arrogance. She had humility, 100% pure humility. So she's begging him again, Lord, help me. But he answered and he said, it's not appropriate to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. (gasps) What? Do you know what he's what he said there? Do you do you understand what he meant? The children again is talking about the children of Israel, the children of the kingdom, the Jews. Okay, the children's bread is that which belongs to the Jews, which again is the promises of God, the blessings of God, you know, miracles, healings, exorcisms. You name it, everything good and fancy that God did and what Jesus did, that is bread. That's the bread. That's the bread. That's why he said it's not appropriate. So he adds insult to insult to insult to injury. And he says it's not appropriate to take the children's bread. That is that this evil, tormenting, severely tormented uh, girl that had evil tormenting spirits uh it's not appropriate to take that which i could do to heal her and throw it to the dogs which are the canaanites would what i mean at least this woman was called a dog he said this is the children's bread you want a miracle you want something you want god to do something special for you that You're asking for the children's bread, the bread that belongs to the children of Israel. It's not appropriate to take the bread that belongs to the children of Israel and toss it to the dogs like this woman. Uh Uh-huh. You you know, you don't hear this in church. You read this in the Bible, but you don't hear this in church. And you don't hear this on Christian TV, by the way, either. Or on Christian radio, by the way. (laughs) But you're hearing it exclusively in the Bible. Okay, we're here for the truth, my friends. We're here for the truth. We want to know the real Jesus. Verse 27, but she said, but again, she said, yes, Lord. Ha, she wasn't offended. She, how dare you call me a dog? How dare you? And I'm a woman. How dare you, you misogynist, racist man? You call me a dog because I'm not a Jew and I'm a woman and you misogynist and you're racist. Huh, I'm going to go to the, you know, the Human Rights Commission here. No, 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 no. Would she have got a miracle if she had that attitude? Absolutely not. Nope. Sorry. No, she wouldn't. But this is the third, the th- you know, strike three here. But she said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I am a dog. That is the children's bread. And and yes, you know, you really, really should be sending me away. But, but, he, she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She wouldn't take no from it for an answer. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She was humble enough to be, to face rejection 
because of her race, possibly even because of her sex, she was humble enough to face rejection and being called a dog and, you know, being told, I mean, being turned away. How many times here? And yet she was persistent enough to say, okay, if I'm a dog, I, I got to find some way to get this bread. Even the dogs eat the crumbs which, which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her and said, woman, great is your faith. Wow. She broke through the mercy of God. You want to break through the mercy of God? Get rid of all your pride. Get rid of all your arrogance and get humble. Yes, if someone says something that, that offends you, don't let it offend you. Don't let it offend you. Take no offense. Push in. Press into God. Did the preacher say something that offended you? Oh, oh well. Press into God. Press in. Jesus answered her, her woman, great is your faith. I mean, think about that statement for a second. He, how many times did he say to his own 12 disciples, okay, these are the 12 people whose names are written on the foundation of heaven. These are the 12 people that he said, I am giving you power and authority to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. These are the 12 that had the, the, the privilege of walking and talking with the Lord himself. As they say, for at least a few years, at least. What a privilege. And how many times do you say to them, you of little faith, you of little faith, you of little faith. Even his own disciples didn't get the, the uh, what would you call it, the praise of saying, great is your faith. But he says to this woman, woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you even as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that hour. Many times, my friend, you got to understand, if you want a healing from God, yes, God still heals. He is not tied up. He's not disabled today. He still heals. Yes, he does. For the same purpose, so that people would believe, so that people would repent. Those were the number one prior, primary purpose purposes in the scripture why he healed. I mean, Jesus condemned people for seeing the healings and not repenting. That's the primary purpose of it let alone the fact that just because of his compassion and love for the people. Yes, God still heals today. God still performs miracles today. God still drives out evil spirits today. Yes, he does. But you got to be humble. We see it over and over and over again. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, did not get his healing, his miracle of, of, of mental, you know, he had, he, was, he had a mental illness. To say the least, okay, he had he he had he was like an animal. It was like he was possessed, um, and he didn't get that till he humbled himself. When he humbled himself, then he got it. He got he's he got his uh, healing. He's got he got his miracle. He got he was restored back in his right mind. But you rewind it again. When did he start getting that mental illness? When he was proud. When he look at what I have done. That's when he started getting that mental illness. Look at Naaman. You know, look at Naaman uh, and, and how he was full of leprosy. And, you know, he was turned away time and time again, just like this woman. And at first he was angry, but the people with him said, why are you so angry? You know, if the prophet were to tell you to climb some great mountain, to do some great feat of, of, of great you know, splendor. And you, if, if the prophet told you to do some great work, wouldn't you do it? I mean, you would do it, right? Because you're, you're all about, you know, you want to look good and you want to be proud. You want to have something to boast about. Why not just something small, like just, just dipping in this river Jordan, even though it is not as good as any of the rivers in your country? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Can you imagine? He humbled himself. He humbled himself. And stripped himself pretty much, you know, naked in front of everybody. And I'm sure people were looking at him go, oh man, look how bad that leprosy is. He's, he was not concerned about his public image. 
He humbled himself. He was not concerned about what his friends thought. He humbled himself and he got healed. Same with this, this woman. Humble yourself. Don't be offended. Don't be offended. That's how you, that's how you get in, in, in trouble. That's how you get in trouble with God, okay? Verse 29, Jesus departed from there and came near to the Sea of Galilee, and he went up into the mountain and sat there. Great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they put them down at his feet, and he healed them. So that the multitude wondered when they saw the mute speaking and the injured healed, the, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Again, to know that it's, this is not just like coming before some TV preacher and saying, pray for me. No. Uh, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of faith. It took humility. And it took repentance. You can't come before the, the, the Lord of the heavens and earth the most holy man, the most holy one. You can't come before the most holy one who constantly condemns sin and hypocrisy. You can't come to, in the presence of him without repentance. At least you can't come in his presence honestly wanting him to do something for you without some kind of humility and some kind of repentance. That's the context, okay? You want that to happen in your life and in your fellowship, Get that context going, the context of humility, confessing your sins to one another, rebuking sin, and, you know, re repentance, repentance, getting rid of the sin, not just feeling sorry, you know, oh, I'm sorry. No, getting rid of it. That's repentance. Verse 32, Jesus summoned his disciples and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. Wow, they, they, were, with, like, they were very, very dedicated. Again, consider the context of these people who got healed. These are people who they considered being in the presence of, of Jesus more important than their food. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm so hungry. I'm so thirsty. I'm dying of thirst. I didn't have a drop of water in three days. Ah, but Jesus' words and his presence is so much more important. That's why Jesus had compassion on them. He said, I don't want to send them away fasting or they might faint on the way. Verse 33, the disciples said to him, where could we get so many lo loaves in a, in, in a deserted place to satisfy so great a multitude? He said, how many loaves do you have? It's all about giving, you see. When you give, you get, things get multiplied. They said seven and a few small fish. A few small fish and seven loaves. And that was obviously for themselves, just for the 12 and for Jesus. He, came, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks and broke them. Again, think about how did he give thanks? It could have been just very similar to the way the Jewish people do today. You know? Baruch atah I Eloheinu melech ha'alam hamotzi lechem min You know? This kind of blessing. He gave thanks and broke them. I mean, it could have been similar to that kind of blessing. And gave the, to the disciples first. And the disciples to the multitudes. Okay, so there's a hierarchy here. There's a protocol here. They all ate and were filled. Okay, we need to follow this protocol. When it, came, when it, when it came to the, the, uh, the food here, the real, the physical food for your physical body, they followed a, a protocol. And same thing when it comes to the, phys, the spiritual food. You need to understand there's a hierarchy here. At the top, there's Jesus and what in the words in red. Under that, under that there are, actually, his, the closest one to him was John out of all of them. And then Peter and James. Peter, James, and John were the, were the closest ones. And then after that were the, you know, the other nine, the, the twelve. So there's a hierarchy here. So whenever you read the scriptures, whenever you read the Bible, whenever you're thinking about well, wh who actually wrote this and what kind of position do they hold, you got to got to take that into context. Like really, you do. And if you if you if you do, then you it, everything really falls in place. You know. 
the Jews have a wonderful way of looking at this. Like they got the Tanakh, right? The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. The Torah, the 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 books of Moses, uh, the Nevi'im, the books of the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which are the scriptures or the writings, you know, including the historical writings and such. And it's in that order: Torah t- first, then Nevi'im, then Ketuvim. If there's anything in the Ketuvim that seems to contradict the Nevi'im, then you go with the Nevi'im because they have more authority. If there's any anything in the Nevi'im that seems to contradict the Torah, go with the Torah because the Torah has more authority. Okay, the Jews know this thing, and we need to we need to get back to the basics. Okay, we need to get back to the roots. Okay, we need to have the same kind of uh, of outlook and and uh, the same kind of perspective. So they took up. Verse 37, they all ate and were filled. They took up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. Verse 38, those who ate were 4,000 men in addition to women and children. Thousands of people. Then he sent away the multitudes after they were fed, after they were all happy and everything. He sent them away, got, got into the boat and came to the borders of Magdala. What an awesome portion of scripture we read. We talked about the traditions of men versus the commandments of God. We talked about how Jesus was not so nice, okay, to, you know, in some people's eyes, in the world's eyes, I guess you might say. We talked about how you shouldn't be offended by anything. That is basically you're biting the bait of Satan. We talked about how Jesus fed the multitudes and how the the whole context of the multitudes, how much they gave up, how much they sacrificed just to listen to the words of Jesus, just to be there and here. And and, and I would assume, uh, safely assume, that they were in great repentance as well. How can you be, having been with Jesus so long, and sacrificing your food and water. Wow, it's amazing. So as you go, may God bless this word. Let this word be enriched in you and multiply in you like the seed on good ground. God bless you. Thanks for watching.